Hey family, welcome to another edition of Cool Jazz Conversations here on WSSB. My name is Marcellus Chapard, the bass man. So glad to be with you once again and proud to have our special guest today. This brother is cool, calm, and definitely collective. And when he hits you with that smile, mm -hmm, he's just <laughs> pulling you in real slowly, man, fully grabbing your attention. Uh, LA native, been rocking out in Chi-Town for quite a while now. Please welcome saxophonist, producer, and vocalist Marquel Jordan thank you for joining us here on cool jazz conversations brother oh man thank you for having me brother really good to see you man and really good to be here most you know, definitely man life absolutely. been treating you well yeah life has been good you know um not without its challenges but it's been it's been good I'm I'm I know that I'm blessed and I know that I'm doing really well I know and, that I'm doing and, really well. and you're healthy yeah yeah you know that was and, and i'll just mention that right off the top like the beginning of the year i had um i contracted coronavirus wow um, yeah like so at the end of january uh started getting a few symptoms and stuff like that and uh i just thought it was a flu you know mm. it, it didn't didn't have a lot of the symptoms that a bunch of people that you hear that have you know unfortunately passed away or have had to deal with long-term effects and that nature I didn't have any of that, so really feel good about that and uh, just bouncing back and trying to get this music together, brother. Yeah, man, well, I'm glad you were on the other side of it, man. As you mentioned, there, there are many out there that didn't have that opportunity to come out of yeah. it on top. So uh, I'm, I'm most definitely glad to hear that that you are A-OK. -okay. So, and for everybody out there listening and watching, you know, take your precautions, man. Socially distance, keep your mask on. This thing is real. Uh, yeah. There's so many naysayers out there, but at the end of the day, from what we are seeing and the people that have been affected, mm -hmm. this thing is real. So let's go back, man. You know, okay. L.A. Cat. Yeah. In Chi-Town, but let's go back to L.A. Okay. Where, yeah. you, were, where you were born, right? right. Okay. Absolutely. So you, you were in L.A. until what age? 13. Um, okay. Then I moved to uh, my dad retired from general motors so he was working through and and you know you may remember you may not remember i might have a few years on you but um you know in the in the uh late 70s and, and early 80s they started closing a lot of the auto plants oh yeah um or you know all of the business started going mm -hmm. to mexico and overseas so my dad was getting laid off a lot um when we were in los angeles and of course you know as a kid i'm loving it everything was cool i'm you know there's few places to grow up cooler than LA. I mean, there's few. You know? I could imagine. <laughs> but um, you know, and and he had to unfortunately move to the family had to move to Kansas City, Kansas. Mm. So um, that's where I moved. And ironically enough, this is around this time of year, is uh around the time of the year that I actually moved. So it was my first time on a plane. I was 13 years old. It was weird. It was weird. So yeah, <laughs> man, it was crazy. So LA though is. You know, even though I haven't lived there for a long time, mm -hmm. it, it influences everything that I am and, and who I am. I, I, I kind of hold on to it because I don't want it to leave me, you know. Right, right. Um, but, you know, just a vibrant city, especially back then, you know, it was a lot to do, uh, a lot of places to go, a lot of energy, a lot of music. Uh, you know, the uh, African-American community was pretty tight knit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was right before um like around the time that i left is when you know the crack era and, and gangs mm -hmm. and all of that stuff started getting real heavy yeah. there so you know in retrospect looking back it was a blessing to leave although that was the last thing i wanted to do at 13. You know? right right so let's talk about the music scene in la i mean was that really where uh, you were exposed to music outside of the household or was that you know once you got to kansas city um, you know, it was a combination because okay. uh, my dad has a great, great record collection, which he was building up back then when I grew up. So, okay, yeah, you know, so I, I always had music around me. And, you know, I had uh, I have two older sisters 
and my parents you know they put them in piano when they were younger mm. uh they put me in drums when i was like five years old but that didn't okay. it didn't stick worth it ah, <laughs> i did you drums know? too around that age yeah that, i can't even do a drum roll up here oh man good I could, and terrible I'm, I'm good for a couple of uh paradiddles you know <laughs> yeah, that's what's up man. <laughs> you know but like his his record collection and then my uncle um KF Roberts is his name. My father's name is Anthony Jordan. Um, shouts out to both of those brothers. But my uncle was a saxophonist, a soprano sax, and a flutist, and mm. also a martial arts master. Like KF Roberts' name rings out in in the black community in Los Angeles. And okay. he was involved in um, uh, this big band uh, that used to do shows in Watts at the church, like. I think one Sunday a month uh, and the name of the band and, and the name of the member or the leader of the band was uh, Horace Tapscott was his name and uh, actually that's a hell of a be, name too yeah man he used to yeah. be married to Marla Gibbs um, oh wow yeah so okay. you know it was like a big band and it was very Afrocentric and the vibe was just like super like just free jazz and you know like LA is kind of known for that vibe and, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't really know that but um so i was soaking all of that stuff up as a kid you know and then of course i got bused to a school in hollywood and started getting to exposed to other stuff like and that was a long ride from where i lived and making all those little stops so it was like an hour and wait a half minute, minute. as as a kid you were yeah. exposed to hollywood yeah man yeah come I was. on man like you know the come wildest on. thing man You're destined for stardom bro yeah man and, and even more of a, of, of a wild thing like the school that i went to um you know because this was back in the heyday of busing mm -hmm. and integration so i went to a magnet school called gardner mini magnet or gardner uh, elementary school okay so it's right around the corner from sunset boulevard and um it was a school that michael jackson went to for a year when they wow. went to LA. yep okay. so like the the auditorium is named after him they did like this big thing um Man, years ago when they named it after so it was it's it was it was cool to go to school there and be exposed to different cultures and like the worst thing about it was the bus ride but then that was cool you know because we got to listen to a lot of different music and then i started getting into stuff like the police and steely dan and all this stuff because the bus drivers were playing that kind of music and gotcha. um so it was just everything man. just everything that vibe just really uh just seeped into my spirit and i think you know obviously i was born with the gift to do it but it was because i had all this music around me and it just kind of nurtured me more and more from that situation you know that is incredible man yeah. hollywood as as a child oh yeah that's right i'm glad you brought that back up yes. so like the wildest things that we used to see um because if if you've watched any like if you watched the movie american pimp Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and um if you talk to all of the pimps that you know the pimps they interviewed on there sunset boulevard was a main track for all of the prostitutes and stuff so you know and we used to drive down sunset boulevard to get to the hollywood freeway to, to get back to the south side where we lived um which is south central which is the generic term but like los angeles watts um gardena inglewood all mm -hmm. of those kind of areas mm -hmm. so but you know, every once in a while we hit that strip and we see a little something, something you know. <laughs> and you talking about like eight or nine year old boys oh and we just God. like at the bus, like, oh right. snap, man. Like, <laughs> you know, man, it was crazy. It was crazy. Wow. But I, I mean, we were sheltered, better. you know, we were sheltered from all that because we obviously we're in elementary school, but it was still all love, man. It was great. Hey man, listen, I don't know too many people who can say as an eight year old child, Right. I was out on the track in LA <laughs> seeing a little something, something, seeing what I saw. Bruh, it was Bruh. real too, man. Yeah, it's crazy. I it can only crazy. imagine, man. Good stuff. So what was Mom Duke's plan in the house or, or Pop's plan in the house that uh, that they exposed you to at, at a young age? And young and age. how did you end up playing saxophone? You said they started you on drums. drums. Right. Then you end up on saxophone. I'm, I'm yeah. assuming it has something to do with your uncle. But go ahead. Um, you know what? Ironically enough, no. Really? Um, nah, man. It, it was crazy because my dad, you know, his collection is kind of the spectrum of black music. So okay. one minute we'd be listening to Johnny Mathis and Ray Charles and mm. stuff like that. And then the next minute it was Earth, Wind & Fire and Parliament Funkadelic. And, you know, and then the next minute it was like 
Miles and Train. You know, my pops loves jazz music, so he played a lot of John Coltrane, mm. uh, a lot of Pharoah Sanders, a lot of uh, Eric Dolphy. Oh, nice. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. So growing up, he always played, like the two records I remember him playing a lot. Um, there are actually three. Uh, kind of Blue, Miles Davis, uh, Love Supreme, John Coltrane, and then there's this uh, re-release of the John Coltrane Live at the Village Vanguard. So he used to play those records all the time. Three classics. Man, and I just got really, really into that sound. You know, mm. but the funny thing is, like, my pops was like, so man, yeah, what you want to do? You want to play horn? I was like, yeah, you know, I think I want to play trumpet. He's like, nah, man, you should play saxophone. You, you want to be like Train, right? You want to be like Train, right? I was like, yeah, I do. So that's kind of where the, the seed was set. And wow. then really once he set, said that and kind of set my mind on that, mm -hmm. it was like saxophone, 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 you know? And um, the school I had just mentioned earlier, I started playing in the band there, like, uh, pretty much immediately. I started getting busted in the third grade. Mm -hmm. And so I started playing in like the, you know, the concert band that they had, but they didn't have any saxophones. So I played clarinet for four years from third grade to the sixth grade. And I graduated and had to go back to school in the hood uh, down the street from the crib. <laughs> and that's in the seventh grade. That's when uh, I played at Henry Clay Junior High School in Los Angeles. Shout out. And, uh, had a great band director there by the name of Johnny Spencer and then he went to Jackson State you know nice. it was just like a bad dude and uh, I started playing saxophone in seventh grade 12 years old that's incredible man first off to be man. so impressionable at a young age that John Coltrane spoke to you exactly uh through your father of course mm -hmm. but uh definitely you know shots uh shout out to pops for having the wherewithal to to nudge you if you will Absolutely. um and and i'm sure that was probably more so just for his own satisfaction more than anything but man uh, was... <laughs> <laughs> the crazy thing about about my father is he's a frustrated musician you know he, um, he um he plays percussion or, or congas and uh can sing a little bit my mom has a pretty good singing voice and uh, okay. my sister, uh, I've got two older sisters, like I mentioned, she's the one in the middle. She had a great singing voice, but she was really more of an athlete. Mm. Um, so music really was my thing. And it was, I, I was kind of, I kind of existed and got good in the shadows. So it wasn't like I was playing saxophone all day, every day at home. You know, it was, a, it was outside of the family. So. You know, fast forward to when I was actually performing and touring and like, you know, my older sister still lives in Los Angeles. Um, I've got a sister. Uh, my other sister lives in Kansas City. Um, my parents live in, in, in Dallas. OK, because they had to move again. So, you know, and, and all of my family in L.A., they never seen me perform before. So when I started touring and performing, it was like, man, I'm about to play in front of my family. This is weird. But, you know, at the same time, it was like, oh, I've been doing this for years. So. It'll they'll just finally get to see what I've been doing, you know, behind closed doors or, you know, on stages that they didn't have access to. So it, it was a trip, man. It really was a trip. So let's uh, let's let's talk about you getting out there and performing and touring. Where did your first professional touring gig come from? Ah, okay, it was with Brian Colbert. So it was with Brian. It okay. was with Brian. Yeah. Wow. Like, so you got the gig as your first gig. Yeah, man. Like the crazy thing was, um, so I, I moved to Kansas City, Kansas, went to high school there, went to college at the University of Kansas, and then I moved up to Chicago uh, in the mid 90s, right after I graduated, a few months after. And, you know, I was in an original band here. We put out our own do it yourself CDs and, and all that kind of stuff. We were on a Jenny Jones show, all of that. <laughs> you know, like we were doing it, but. You know, in Chicago, unfortunately, there's there's a lot of great musicians, mm -hmm. and you know you can name you can name drop Curtis Mayfield or you know somebody like uh, even though he's persona non grata right now, R. Kelly or you know Kanye West, those kinds of people, and they all have these Chicago ties or from Chicago. Plenty of talent here, but once all of the record companies like moved to Los Angeles or you know dissolved in the 70s like there's not much of an industry here to push propel someone forward i mean i think the only thing i could see it in was like maybe the hip-hop scene 
on in like the indie rock scene and we were somewhere like we, were, we didn't really have a style so to speak so we were one minute we would play like james brown the sliding family stone the next minute we was rocking out you know and then we we were oh but jumpers know, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. We, you were black and white band too so it's like we didn't really find an audience but anytime anybody saw us it was like man y'all killing you know but nothing happened with that and i wound up getting married i had a child so i didn't think I was like, well, this is it. I'll be a weekend warrior working a day job like I was doing, and that was that. And I got laid off from my job, and I ran into uh, my good buddy, Chris Miskell, who's a drummer for Brian. He'd been a drummer for Culbertson for like maybe four years at that point. And uh, they were looking for a saxophone player. Mm. And, you know, and Brian wanted a name because I was coming behind like Eric Darius, who right. even at his young age was a was name. Out there. Yeah, 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 he was a name at that point, and like he wanted to focus and do his solo thing. So they were, he was getting Eric to sub on some gigs, and he was getting Michael Linkton to sub on some gigs as well. But Chris was like, "Hey man, I got a guy in Chicago. Not only does he sing his bleep off, he also, you know, <laughs> plays saxophone. Like, and he was really just kind of like." Um, you know, just vying for me, just really pushing for me to get the gig. And it was from one conversation, I ran into him, I was like, he's like, man, so what do you want to do? You laid off. He's like, man, I don't want to go back to work. I would rather just be a musician full time. He's like, okay, I'll talk to Brian about it. Um, and then, you, you know, you hear that all the time. He's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Right, right. And people, then like, yeah. yeah, you know, people want to hook you up, but mm -hmm. they don't necessarily do it or they don't have the means or any of that. So that was like October, 2007. And then in January 2008, Brian had a show in Chicago and Chris hit me up a couple of days prior and was like, Brian wants to meet you. So I had the perfect audition. It was at a gig, people there, you know, um, it you know, wasn't the pressure of trying to stand in front of someone in like this stale room and try to really right. make something happen. Real I was that, like, yeah. I got all this energy around me. And at this point, I'm like in my mid thirties. So there was nothing to really be afraid of. Right. The only thing that I was thinking was like, he's not getting out of here without giving me this gig. I know and that's, that's right. exactly that's what That's the happened. mindset. Yeah. I mean, I said it. I sat on it to do that. And we talked. He dug what he heard. Um, and then a couple of days after that, he offered me the gig. So, yeah, that was my first touring situation at the ripe old age of 37, man, which is crazy. Wow. Doesn't happen for people like that, man. So wow. I know I'm blessed. And you stayed with Brian for what, 15? 10, 10 years. 10 years, 10 years, okay, 10, 10 years. years. I, was, I was just trying to make you older than what you were, bro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, you know black don't crack, baby, so it's all It don't, good, man, it man. don't. You see me looking like you're 36 now, man. <laughs> but listen, so, it. you know, 10 years with Brian, you know, multi-instrumentalist, amazing mm -hmm. cat, you know, uh, definitely known for his high energy stage persona, yeah, um, and his incredible albums as as well. You know, and he's right. been in the business twenty plus years now as as a solo act. What did you learn from Brian in those you know, two, uh, ten years? I think um, what I learned more than anything else was just that it's about bringing it every night. Mm. Um, and when I say bringing it, it's like being prepared, um, being on time, obviously, all of those things that people should know about as a musician, especially but, at that but point. They take for granted. Yeah, mm. you know, being on time, being prepared, and giving your all to a show. Hmm. And then when the show is over, giving your all to the fans after it's over. You know, mm -hmm. like it just doesn't stop once you get off the stage. And, you know, that level of commitment and attention to detail uh is what i learned you know because a lot of the music aspect of it you know you learn over time of playing in clubs and you kind of know it but it just it's another level it's kind of like from going you know from college to the pros if you're an athlete you know right. it's like you know and then you see the guys that are successful and you see the guys that are kind of successful and mm -hmm. then you know why when you look at both situations and and you know those are the things I learned. And then a lot of stuff I learned just by watching, you know, just how he would deal with the audience, how he dealt with his fans after the show, um, how he would set up every release. And then towards the last uh, couple of years that I was in the band, how he would set up every release and a tour, 
you know, right. because to coincide with it. Yeah. 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 Got to have that to a set, man. Absolutely. So to flip it, what did you learn specifically about yourself during your time with Brian? Hmm. That is a great question. Um, that I needed to work harder, that I need to be focused more. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that ultimately it didn't really matter who the gig would be with. Like it could have been with, and I'll name some of my heroes. It could have been with Michelle and Deggio. It could have mm -hmm. been with Marcus Miller. Yeah. Um, it, it could have been with The Roots. It could have been with, you know, Miles Davis or anybody like that. At a certain point, I knew I wanted to do my own thing, you know. And even I could feel that when I was even in the bands back in Chicago and we were doing local things. And 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 the funny thing about that was I was up front. I was the lead man. I was singing and playing and doing all of this stuff. So for all intents and purposes, it looked like it was my band. But behind the scenes, creatively, you know, it was, a, you know, it was a community thing. It wasn't me running it. It wasn't me doing it. You know, and I didn't really have those kinds of skills at that point yet. But once I got in Brian's band and I realized I could actually do this, hmm. then that's what it became about for me. Um, you know, and I didn't really talk to anybody about it. I would talk to maybe close associates, but you know, it was just kind of like, how do I get from being a member of this band to being an artist, you know? Right. And it's a big, big difference. You know, it's, 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 there's responsibility there. There's a you know, total focus different level there. of responsibility. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I, that's what I learned is just like, you know, I learned that I actually had the desire and the mindset to want to do it. Now, you know, obviously, since I've been an artist, there's ups and downs, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, most of which like the pandemic that we're going through. But yeah, man. But, you know, it, it's it's something that I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade those 10 years, but I'm so glad that I'm doing me now. You know, was it was it hard for you, you know, being that there was this um the the sense of comfort you know we all get comfortable in our right. jobs you know day in day out you know you you see that tour schedule you're like you know what i know i'm eating good from exactly. from march through october i'm eating good so exactly you know yeah. and then you're like okay well if i get out there on my own then i'm going to be responsible for making sure not only i eat good mm -hmm. but everybody else in the band it's good. How how hard of a decision was it for you, knowing that you know you had that inkling inside, that desire mm -hmm. inside to step out there on your own? How hard was it for you to do it, and how long did it actually take for you from you saying, you know what, I'm going to do this, mm -hmm. to it actually happening? You know, the funny thing about it was that entire ten year time, it was in the mind state. It was okay. in my mind. Um, so what was really weird was uh, that we had a. Uh, well, not really weird, but just eye open. Mm -hmm. First year I was with Brian, um, had a, a tour manager and a sound guy by the name of Rick Camp. And Rick has worked with everybody. Um, and Rick, on the third show, he comes up to me while we're setting up on stage. And it was really hectic. Those And we were playing the festival. So trying to set up between bands and festivals, always hectic. Tempers be flaring. It's like always nuts. So in the middle of all of this craziness, Rick looks over to me and he leans over. He's like, you know you can do this, right? And I was like, yeah, I know mm -hmm. I can. That was the third show. And um, then later on that year, um, Brian used to do a Christmas tour. And one of the artists that was a guest artist touring with us, and we, we only did like eight dates. It was a real short package type of deal. But one of the artists that was on the tour was Mike Phillips. And mm -hmm. Mike Phillips was like, you're next, right? So, wow. so that's my, that's year one. That's the end of year one. I didn't get my first record out until five, year five with Brian. So like, you know, the end of 2013, early 2014, right. that's my first when album came, came out. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I was trying to do at that point was still be in the band and work with Brian because I was actually out of the band for six months because I tore my Achilles tendon mm -hmm. uh, playing basketball on a smooth jazz crew. And I was Shame. a featured artist on the cruise. <laughs> Dude. I was on stage with Brian sitting oh in, in like a, you know, a bar stool with a big cast on. Cause I, it no. was in Cozumel, man. It was in Cozumel. Wow. So they, the ER in Cozumel. So they didn't put on like the little nice little cast that yeah. goes up to your calf. Cause that's yeah, all that I ugly really thing on. That all rap. the way 
all the way up to like the groin, brother. Damn. It was heavy too, you know. <laughs> so, um, so I had I was out of band for six months, but when I got back in, my record was coming out, and it was like, okay, stick around. This is great. Learn what you need to learn. Um, and then in a couple of years, that's when Brian started doing like the. Uh, he would roll out of his album. He would roll his album out, but then do like a three month or a two month tour, kind of mm -hmm. like the rock stars do, which mm -hmm. is unheard of in smooth jazz. He's right. the only guy that does it. So, you know, when we did the first tour like that, that was like 2016. I was thinking, okay, I gotta be gone. That's what I was thinking then. Like, this is over. Once this is over, I gotta get my record out and it's done. But it was just hard to serve two masters, really. Like it was, yeah. you know, his schedule demanded a level of responsibility and commitment that is definitely going to take away from what you're doing or trying to do as an artist so you know i was the last couple of years it was just like kind of growing pains i was ready to go but i wasn't ready to go you know what right. i mean right so but i just had to set my intention on it i was like okay if you don't leave now you're not gonna leave you know because mm -hmm. there's plenty of stories of guys who are sidemen with any band yeah. um, that talk about leaving and they never leave and I didn't want to be that guy so you know Brian and I had a conversation like in 2017 um, he told me he wanted to do another tour for his new record that was coming out and I was telling him well I was thinking 2017 would be my last year so if you want to use me for the tour that's cool because frankly you know that's a lot of money to leave on the table yeah man uh, you know, my daughter was uh, going to private school. Oh, <laughs> you know, they, they so it was like every month. Yes, sir. Man, so yeah. it was. I definitely that last tour was a financial decision, mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it just kind of worked out. He didn't find someone that he really liked. I was still available. My second record was in the beginning stages of being done, and he was like, "Hey, man, you want to sell your record on this tour?" I was like, "Nah," because I really want to focus on getting it played on radio i don't really even care about the sales so my my whole thought process was completely different. you were focused i was trying to was who, trying to who turns it. down album <laughs> sales well i mean brian Colbertson. you know and then and then the other thing was it wasn't done too like if okay. it was done it might gotcha. have been a different thing gotcha. but you, you didn't know, want to rush something gotcha. didn't want to rush it and then i thought that i'd be able to work on it while i was on tour with him but that last tour was grueling mm -hmm. it was it was great because I knew it was going to be the last tour. Everybody in the band knew it was my last tour. Um, it just wasn't announced to the public. So I went out like with a bang. You know, every show was just like, let's have some fun. Yeah. But, you know, three months on the road and we only got a chance to go home for three days. Wow. Um, yeah, it was tough. So that's, yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. So mentally I was I was there, but I was gone. And by the time I did my last show with Brian, I was like, yep. This is it. This is like it. when you know, like all when you know, you know. Yeah, like all athletes say, man, yeah. When did you know you were done? It's like, man, I yeah. just didn't want to do this anymore. Like yeah. it was just like you've. Ex I I spent all the I expended all the energy I could to that situation. I needed to save some for my situation. Really good stuff. Well, if you are just joining the conversation, we are joined today by the great saxophonist, producer, and vocalist Markwell Jordan. He has uh, some incredible music out there, and this is a brother who has been able to move in between genres flawlessly, whether he's playing R&B or jazz or funk or inspirational. I mean, the brother can just just move through it, man, and not not everybody can do that, Markwell. And everybody can do that. So hats off to you for it, man. Thank you. Thank you know, as I look at your list of uh, collaborations, I mean, it's it's pretty incredible. Isaiah Sharkey, Frank McComb, mm -hmm. uh, Mesa, Phil Perry, Kenya, yeah. Brian Culbertson, of course, just to name a few. But yeah. who's on your collaboration wish list? Um, you know, the the big one. There's, there's a few people, so I'll I'll say the the big one quote unquote for last but um i've uh talked to cy smith a lot would love to nice. work with her on record cy. she's oh, so she's beautiful a, man she's just amazing. inside and out man absolutely so underrated I would, too man and i don't know why because she is the bee's knees she's ridiculous man as an artist uh visionary writer singer i mean that yeah. voice is just crazy right. so 
um, you know, we did a show together. Um, actually, her and Frank were on this show. It was a tribute to Donnie Hathaway in Chicago, mm. like uh, a year and a half ago. You can't do a tribute for Donnie without Frank. Without I mean, Frank, you can't. Yeah, man. he's Donnie. <laughs> Donnie reincarnated. That's, exactly. That's, yeah, that's my man. So you yeah. know, so size on the list. Um, man, Carol Riddick is on the list as well. Oh, yeah. Same okay. thing with with Carol, and and like we've known each other now for I, we met on the, the Capital Jazz super cruise mm -hmm. um so she's amazing would love to work with her that would be cool um those are people that are tangible and those things have been in the works and we were talking about it right. it just hasn't happened yet um but the thing that was really going to happen when everything shut down around this time last year i was on my way to fly to eric robeson's house oh, to work man. on music like for a couple of days man, man. and and we just, everybody, I mean, you remember what it was like. Everybody yeah. was trying to figure out what to do and everybody just scrambled. Right. And we just all kind of figured out what we needed to do, how we needed to get through it. And, and some people like, you know, like someone like as prolific as Eric, he just really, you know, he just right. kept doing what he was doing. Right. You know, someone from like myself, for example, you know, it was, some, it was tough, you know, and then I, I lost a good friend of mine who passed away, uh, had a sudden heart attack in the summer. Wow, oh, condolences. Thank you. Of 2020, Kahari Park, a great drummer. And um, that really threw me for a loop. I actually was really depressed about it for a long time mm -hmm. and, and didn't know. Like with that and the election and George Floyd and right. everything that was going That's on. 2020. Man, oof, you know, and so it, 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 it took my head out for a minute. So I really had to acknowledge that and then be like, okay, the only timetable that you're setting is the one that you're setting for yourself because it's my true, label. True. You know, it, it's I get to move this train as fast or as slow as I want it to. And, right. you know, I just kind of slowed it down until I could get back in the right frame of mind to work again. Because performing is like, you know, I mean, I'm sure you know that as well, voice that, you know, it performing is second nature. You yeah. know? But creating. It's what we do. Yeah, creating and, and, and writing music and, and trying to get something that speaks to you so that it hopefully speaks to other people and that, you know, that you're connected to the creator and everything is going through and every it that was different. That's it, a process. And, yeah. And it and it takes a lot of energy and focus. And I just yeah. didn't, emotionally I was just spent at that point, man. But I don't wow. see myself being any different from anybody else that was dealing with that stuff then. You know, or now. You know what would be so great, and there's so many things I want to talk about. We haven't even played any music yet, which right, we right. do, but <laughs> you know, just thinking about the Capital Jazz Cruise, first off, it's it's a huge reunion for the cruisers, number one. Absolutely. But then for the artists, it's even more of a reunion, but it's all, also like, um, you know, you, you have this, this huge, I don't want to call it a date, but... You have all of these people that you've loved, yeah. mm -hmm. you've been seeing and, and hearing for years, and all of a sudden you're in the same room with them, and yeah. the energy is incredible. And you watch a show, and you're seeing yourself, and you're hearing something, and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna work with this person. And I know so many times that artists say, you know, let's let's do something. You know, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna connect. And I know that was part of the conversation with you with Eric on this last cruise. Yeah. Oh, you were like, we're finally going to do something together. Yeah. How great would it be if they actually set up a recording studio oh. there on the ship <laughs> so that after the late night jam session, yeah. those who really wanted to produce something could go in there and produce, you know, at least lay yeah. a track down, some framework, take it home, finish. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, that's I'm going to have to talk to Cliff about that, man. Yeah. You know, yeah. the only the drawback of that is there are people who are performers and then there are people that are studio rats. You, you wouldn't be able to get the studio rats out of that. Right, they would be in there all night long. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yo, right. yo, it it yo. would have to be a serious schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's that would be the only drawback. But yeah, to have yeah. that there because the energy, I mean, playing you know the the Colson gig definitely changed my life. But mm -hmm. you know, an extension of that is the Capital Jazz Super Cruise really changed my life because yeah. that's where I really met Frank McComb. That's where I really met. And vibed with a producer that's, been, that's worked on all of my records, Chris, Chris Big, Big Dog, Dog Davis. Davis. Come on, yeah. man. 
Yeah. You know, so it was through that connection, you know, and I have to give a shout out to my man, Wayne Bruce, from Spur of the Moment. That's you know, dude. yeah, that's the homie, you know, yeah. he was musical he's, director for a long time. He's the plug. Time. He's the yeah. plug. He, and he plugged me, you know, mm-hmm. and it was a situation where it was a baptism under fire mm-hmm. because there was some vocalists, because um, we both were in Culbertson's band at the same time. We both were the new guys, you know, and we got along well. He's a college grad and Greek, you know, he's a Kappa, of course. He's, he's a Kappa, A5A yeah. back there. You already so, know, baby. Yep. <laughs> I, I see the crest back there, brother. Yes, it's all love. But um, there was some vocalists that were supposed to sing background for Patty Austin on a cruise. And, and Brian was a featured performer. So we were going to be on a cruise. And uh, the background vocalist or that situation, something happened, they pulled out. So Wayne was looking at me like, hey, man, can you sing background for Patty Austin? Do you think you could do it? And I'm like, yeah, I could do it. it. Yeah, you know. And at that point, Wayne just had seen me do what I did with Brian, which was cool. Right. But this was something different, and his reputation was on the line. So, Patty Austin, yeah, Lady man, Patty Austin, exactly. She is sung with <laughs> whoever, everybody. Yeah, that's that's Quincy Jones's goddaughter, exactly. Yeah. You know, um, so no pressure, you know. And we did the show, and everything turned out great. So, nice. then after that, even once Brian stopped doing Capital Jazz Cruise, I was always hired, I was the one non DMV based musician playing that it. would always play in a house band in a house band every yeah. year yeah. yeah and hats and off that, to you that man, wide my... you, you you did that for what like 9 years before becoming the headliner yeah on absolutely. the cruise last year so mm-hmm. congrats to you man how how did it feel finally having that opportunity it was like you know you've been in the background you know, everybody been checking yeah. you out all these years and different different bands or what have you. And then that next year, you're a headliner, man. I know it had to feel good, bro. It felt incredible um, because, you know, I had done featured shows there, but it was different. It was, you know, they had like the basement kind of thing. Like we were downstairs in a small room and it was like I was playing with another artist and we kind of did a show together. So it was mm-hmm. like I do three or four songs or two songs and I'd stop and the other artists would do two songs and that kind of thing. And that was great because it was still exposure. It was still cool. But this was a bigger room, yeah, man. bigger stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was opening for Norman Brown. So there was going to be more eyes in the room, no matter what. And um, man, it was incredible. It felt like the great culmination of all of what had transpired since 2008 since i first did my first one there and and it was yeah so the year last year started off on a super duper high because not only that then my man isaiah sharky was on the cruise and i performed with him him. yeah i remember you know and i was a big part of um the uh the funk tribute shows that spur Mm. the moment did like for two years those last two years man you know it was like you know they were running it but i was up front like really running it you know right. and wayne just was like do your do thing. thing right do your thing so it was it was cool man i you know i've never there's only been one other show ironically enough and that was in the dmv too that i sold all of my cds that i actually sold out and that happened on the capital jazz cruise this last run sold That's all awesome. my cds man so i was happy super That's happy awesome. about that yeah i totally missed the cruise not yeah. happening this year I, you know it's it a whole void that was there but you know when, yeah. when when things get back to a little bit of normalcy we'll we'll be back at it for sure but i'm, I'm looking forward to that okay so we're we're well over 30 minutes in here we've not played any music you have a brand new single uh, that is days away from uh, from being launched, man. Tell me about it. Okay. Um, the name of this song is Last Call. And it's a collaboration with uh, Chris Big Dog Davis. It's really all him. You know, like when it's time to make a record, it's like, hey, dog, you got some music? Yeah. So, you know, he sent me, you know, he sent me like six songs and I wound up picking four of them. <laughs> so, the man has you know, a vault of music. Exactly. Let's exactly. put that out there. Yeah. You know, and then the vibe, the vibe of the song is just like really kind of like spacey, kind of, uh, no, nah, that's not the right word. Kinda, do you remember like those spy shows from like the 60s or like Ocean's Eleven? Oh, yeah. 
remember the music that was kind of playing all the time when they were walking around in Ocean's Eleven? It reminded me of that. Like that's the vibe of the song, you know, and it was pretty catchy. Um, I could do my thing with it. And it, it also just gave me that vibe of like, this would either be like an encore of a, of a show, you know, after you done took people crazy and then you come back, you do something nice and, and groovy and mellow and just send them on their way. Or, you know, after the gig is over and you hanging with, you know, the, the lady friend or the homies and you're sitting there and it's like last call at the bar, last you know, call. and you're just chilling. So <laughs> that's, that's the vibe of that song. Um, you know, I, I think radio is going to love it. I hope radio loves it because I, I feel like this is, this is a continuation, another brick in the wall for, for my foundation, for what I'm doing. Most definitely. Well, here it is right now. World premiere here on Cool Jazz Conversations. Markwell Jordan, last call on WSSB. that family it is brand new music by all means let us know how you feel about it markwell jordan the great saxophonist producer and vocalist our special guest here today on cool jazz conversations man loving the vibe on that and uh with chris big dog davis on there i mean you, oh, you can't go wrong man yeah, yeah you know i was i was going to ask you who your favorite producer is but already knowing that you work with chris i i know it's chris but <laughs> it, it, it cannot be anybody but chris what has he taught you as a fellow producer about music you know what is is there any one thing that he shared with you about the the process of of producing music you know layering tracks or or starting out with the the hook or the melody, the process. What what is it exactly that the man has has given you that stands out the most? I think um, he just has this freedom to just be in a moment and create. Hmm. Um, you know that like whatever he's thinking, he'll put it down. Hmm. You know, and I think that's been a challenge for me. Um, it continues to be a challenge, you know, because I think a lot of times when you're working on music, um, you self edit, like you don't see it through. He'll see it through and and then go back and be like, OK, this works. That doesn't work. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. You know, that kind of thing. And this, and but most of the stuff that he does works because he's so available to the creative process in the moment. And that's mm -hmm. the thing that he always tries to tell me to do is you know just be in a moment just capture what you're trying to say and 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 and, and go in there and really just be you you know don't hold back just be you and be relaxed and be comfortable with being yourself you know i think that's the biggest thing um from a technical standpoint when i did my first record i'd never really worked with a producer outside of uh my man that I work with here in Chicago, shout out to my man, DJ INC. And that's a different kind of situation because, you know, he's like, he's really just kind of like, you be as creative as you want. You do what you want to do. Here's a track, it's done. Go do it. it up. Yeah, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So, yeah. but with 
working with somebody that was outside of my comfort zone, you know, and really thinking like, man, this cat has worked with Mesa. He's worked with Kim Waters. He's worked with Phil Perry, like, and he's a beast Everybody, yeah. as a musician. It was like, oh, yes. snap. Like, you know, so there was a level of like just nervousness or, you know, borderline intimidation I felt coming in the situation. And he just eased me all the way out. You know, nice. it's like, okay, go here, do that, do that, do that. And then when we put it together, I was like, oh, that's how you make a song. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I know? tell you, man, you know, for those who aren't familiar with Chris Big Dog Davis, Big Dog is, he's the special sauce of the contemporary jazz world behind mm -hmm. so many great artists. I mean, he just has that secret sauce that just, it just makes everything better. Yeah everyone Absolutely. better you know yeah. and so so hats off to him um you know mark well you are one who understands the power of social media mm -hmm. uh you do an amazing job across platforms and oh, always you, see man. you out there promoting and and uh reaching out and having that connection with with your listeners which is uh which is so important uh especially in this day and age where we're not able to to fully be in physical contact with people. So you do a good job uh, virtually, what have you. But tell me about this series of yours, The Catalyst. Ah, yes. Um, that is um, a boutique experience, if you mm -hmm. will. You know, like a subscription-based uh, uh, fan club, if you will. Okay. So, you know, there's there are fans and then there are people who are connected to you and it, it, it and it's pretty much set up like netflix or you know hbo max or any of those kinds of things so there's a monthly nominal fee it's not that much you know and then you know you get access to me outside of social media uh so there's there's um exclusive music that you know hasn't been released to the public or performances and things of that nature that people that are in the catalyst uh membership are privy to you know and then once the world opens back up then they're like meet and greets that are going to go on and you know they'll get first dibs on when the cd comes out or if i want to be in town it's just like hey you know tickets go on sale this throw this code in because you're a member of the catalyst and then you, you know, discount yeah. get that old discount thing mm -hmm. so you know i think um we've had to reinvent the wheel um and we've had to take even more control of our content Mm -hmm. and you know of our art you know and 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 give people a little more access than you know probably what we would have done five or six years ago right. uh but it's just the name of the game now people want to know you and this is a way for people to get to know me more as an artist and, and, and in some ways as a person too um and a way to support the career as well so that's what's happening it's been going now for um seven or eight months and it's it's going well i've got a loyal uh base of people that are supporting and you know it's you can still join right now <laughs> well for <laughs> folks who are interested how can uh how can they get more information on that um you can get more information from my website uh which is about to be relaunched it's like on the precipice of being relaunched uh markwelljordan.com so that's m-a-r-q-u-e-a-l j-o-r-d-a-n Dot com. I mentioned in social media, it's in my uh, Instagram uh, bio. Um, and, you know, you can hit me up directly and we can talk about it. So, you know, there's there's a campaign that goes out and I was blasted out and all of those kinds of things as well. So pay attention to social media or just hit me up. And what is the social website. media handle? Handle is Markwell Jordan as well. And that's on Instagram and Twitter. On Facebook, it's uh, Markwell Jordan Music. Uh, my personal page is maxed out. So I'm trying to get people to go to the music page, but everybody wants that personal connection. Everybody wants yeah. it. Yeah. So, you know, I can I can obviously have more followers on my page, but not accept um, more friends. More friends. Yeah. So, that 5,000 so that's, limit. Yeah. How, how dare you tell me how many friends I can have? <laughs> what? Right. And my manager, <laughs> shout out to Andrea Young. She was just getting on me today. She was like, you need to get a link tree together. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, so Linktree will be happening, TikTok will be happening, all of this kinds of stuff. So, you know, right now I'm really in a, a phase to really push out more and, um, you know, be accessible in a, in a lot more ways to, to 
ramp up and get closer to this uh, the singles coming out obviously but for the album the actual album release which will be happening later on this spring nice well bro i mean this hour just flew by and i didn't even get through half of the things that i wanted to talk to you about man because so, i talk so much man it's, like, it's all good man but you know it was, it was great conversation and that just means that we just have to bring you back in for another around here on cool jazz conversations but listen bro i appreciate you from the bottom of my heart i've been Thank a fan you. since day one as soon as i heard catalyst i was blasting it in baltimore and oh, and man. then when uh intentions and, and purpose came out same deal and so you know with this new project i'm looking yeah. forward to that as well so uh you know we dropped Thank the you. exclusive here today and uh as more of that music comes out man get it to me and i will definitely get it to the people you got it, man. And actually, I should mention what, uh, before we get up out of here, I know you, we're pressed for time, but the name of the new album, um, because it speaks to the times, is really important to me. Like, album titles to me are super duper important. Mm -hmm. So the title of the album is All We Have Are Moments, because wow. that's really all we got. You know, that's wow. it. So, and I I'm trying that. to be, exactly, I'm trying to be right in the moment when it happens mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Um, and give my all to it. So, you know, um, the music will reflect that. Um, and, and it'll just be, a, 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 like I said, a continuation on, on what we've done. But I appreciate your support, man. Thank you, brother. And my thanks pleasure. for having me on here anytime, anytime, yes, man. Sir. Just you can call me five minutes, you know, like, hey, man, we need you five minutes. If I'm there, let's do it. Yes, sir. Most definitely, boy. Markwell Jordan right here on Cool Jazz Conversations. That is going to do it for this edition. Uh, the program is a production of TVM Productions and is broadcast from its home of WSSB 90.3 FM at South Carolina State University. You can catch the podcast of this program on iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Alexa, Amazon Music, Player FM, Google Pocket. Look, you can find it everywhere. Or you can <laughs> download it at cooljazzconversations.podbean.com. Wow. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Cool Jazz Conversations. And we'll see you next time right here on Cool Jazz Conversations. Peace. Peace.